Greetings, Body of Messiah. Mark Pulley here with Yahweh Yeshua Assembly in Fort Myers. I pray this Sukkot that you are having an awesome week, enjoying Yah's presence, celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Sukkot. Today we're going to teach about the Yahshua's birth line. When was he born? Well, we know for sure, and we're going to show all this, that it wasn't in the winter months of December like the world thinks, like um, Rome has taught many of us. And so we're going to go back to the scripture, renew our minds to Yah's word. I want to welcome you to our channel. We pray as always, that you would continue to grow and increase and multiply in your knowledge of Yah's Torah, in your knowledge of His laws and commandments, which start in Genesis and go through all the book of Revelation. The whole scripture is Yah's Torah. So let's get started. In Luke chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Since many took in hand to draw up an account concerning the matters having been born out among us, as those from the beginning delivered to us, becoming eyewitnesses and ministers of the Torah. It seemed good also to me, now this is Luke speaking, having traced out all things accurately. See, that's a key thing in our, in our life, that we need to research, trace out all things accurately so that we have accurate knowledge, accurate faith, and an accurate way of believing according to the Hebraic scriptures. From the first, to write to you, most excellent Theophilus. Now this is the only time that I have found this person's name mentioned in the scripture. So he's writing this letter to this individual to give him an accurate account of what ha took place through the birth, death, resurrection of Messiah Yahshua. Then it says that you may know the certainty. See, that he, Luke's writing is that this man would know for certain and that my prayer is that you and I would know for certain about Yahshua's birth, when it was, when we're to celebrate it, how we're to celebrate it. And we are not to celebrate his birthday like pagans celebrate their birthdays, making wishes, birthday cakes. Those are all celebrations unto the gods, meaning pagan gods. It doesn't necessarily mean we can't honor someone's birth, but we are not to do it the way the pagans do it. We are to do it the way Yah says to do it. His commandments say to do it. All right, verse 5. In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the daily course of Abijah. Now, Zechariah was a priest, and he had his responsibility, he had, excuse me, he had his responsibility, like every other priest, and his responsibility, like every other priest, they were to fulfill their function, their duty, twice a year, for two Sabbaths or two weeks in the fall feasts, and then for two Sabbaths or two weeks in the spring feasts. Now, I may not get to everything that this is about because there's a lot of things I want to share, and I don't want it to be two hours long, um, but I want to bring you enough information so that you can do your own research and you can see what the scriptures say. We need to read this Hebraically because that's how this was written. 
We need to understand the culture of the times, uh, the context. We need to understand what it was like in Israel, whether it was in the winter months, whether it was in the fall months, the spring months, so on and so forth. And so it says here that Zechariah, of his daily course of Abijah, which you can read in 1 Chronicles 24, verse 10, and his wife, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So they both come from pure bloodlines of Hebraic quality. And they were both righteous before Elohim, walking blameless in all the commandments and in ordinances of Yah. Now here's something, that, here's a point that, that we need to grasp. Just because you have not experienced yet some of the promises that are written, that are promised when you obey His laws and commandments, whatever those promises might be, just because you may not be experiencing them, does not mean you are in sin or you are breaking Yah's law. It does not mean anything on that line of thinking. Now, contrary, it also doesn't mean if you are receiving Yah's blessing that you are in obedience to Yah's laws and commandments. So we need to keep that in mind. One, if you're receiving the blessing, you don't get puffed up. You stay humble. And if you're not receiving His blessing and you're obeying His laws and commandments, to keep obeying His laws and commandments, to keep walking by faith, believing to have received whatever is written. Because here... They received it, and they must have been praying for many, many, many years. And it says, verse 7, And no child was born to them, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in age. Now I did a little research on how old um, Zechariah and Elizabeth possibly were. Now some of the research said, that Zechariah at this time was 99 and Elizabeth was 88. Some other research says they had to be at least 60 years old each because that was considered advanced in their ages for that time period. So we know it was at least in the 60s. Now I, won, I read one thing online that said um, Muslim, Muslims believe Zechariah was 92. So nonetheless, if he was in his 70s, 80s, 90s, and she was in her 70s, 80s, or 90s, think about you being in your 70s, 80s, or 90s and having a child. No, thank you. All right. Then it says in verse 8, And it happened in his serving as priest in the order of his course. So he had his responsibility, his calling, and he was functioning in it. According to the custom of the priests, entering into the holy place of Yah, it was Zechariah's lot to burn incense. Now, when was this taking place? See, we've never been taught those types of things. This was taking place during the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Pentecost in the springtime. All right, that's when this was taking place. And all the multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. And a cherub of Yah appeared to him, to Zechariah, standing on the right of the altar of incense. Angels are very much active in our life. And seeing this, Zechariah was troubled and fear fell on him. And the cherub of Yah said to him, Do not fear, Zechariah, because your prayer was heard. 
and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son to you, and you shall call his name Yohanan, Yohanan, or John. And that means in the Hebrew, Yah is grace. So every time Elizabeth called John for supper, she's saying, Yah is grace, Yah is gracious, Yah is graceful. Praise Yah. And, and the angel said, you shall call his name John. And he will be joy and exaltation to you, and many will rejoice over his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of Yah. And he shall not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with Yah's spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel to Yah, their Elohim. So this also tells us that just because you are native born doesn't necessarily mean you are serving and obeying the Elohim of Israel, Yah. Because it says here that he's going to turn many of the sons of Israel to Yah. So that means they were not serving Yah. They were serving Baal gods. Just like today, many people in Christianity, they may have a heart for the Messiah, they may have a heart for the Father, and they may love Him, but that doesn't mean that every one of them are saved. How do you know if you're really born from above? Yahshua answered that, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will have a heart, you will have a passion to obey Yah's laws and commandments. Verse 17, then it says, And he, John, will go out before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now this is a prophetic word that came from Malachi in chapter 4, verses 5, verse 5 and 6. And then it says, And he will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children, and disobedient ones to the knowledge of the just. So if you could have been a natural born Hebrew and not obedient to Yah's laws and commandments, and Yahshua revealed this constantly to the Pharisees and to, to the people of Israel, that they were keeping the law externally but their heart was far from it they were not obeying Yah's laws and commandments as they thought they were obeying the traditions of the of the rabbis more than Yah's laws and commandments if they were doing that how much more today people that say they love Yah they say they love the Messiah they love the Father they believe they're born from above, and they probably are if they believe that. But, are they obedient to Yah's laws and commandments? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves. That's what makes you righteous. The blood of Yahshua as you follow Him in obeying Yah's laws and commandments. Disobeying Yah's laws and commandments people that reject obeying the Sabbath, people that reject obeying the feast days, people that reject um, his instructions on what we should eat and what we should not eat and everything else, you are rejecting Torah, you are rejecting Yah's laws and commandments, and you are not in a positive position in right relationship with Yah, even though you know at some time you were born from above, even though you have some form of relationship. Israel had the same thing. They had some form of relationship, but it wasn't of righteousness. So we need to discern these things. All right, let's keep going. Verse 18, And, and Zechariah said to the cherub, or the angel, By what shall I know this? For I am old, and my wife is advanced in her days. He could have been saying, man, we don't even have re romantic relations anymore. We are up there in age. We don't even have the desires anymore. 
What's the deal? How is this going to take place? And answering, the cherub said to, to him, I am Gabriel, who stands before Yah, and I was sent to speak to you and announce to you the good news of these things. And because of the unbelief in Zechariah, the angel said that he was, his, he was going to be silenced until John was born. Now, this, here's a good note to take out of this. That if one of the reasons that the angel probably had to silence him was that his mouth, his unbelief, his negative confessions, his fear-based speech would cancel out Yah's laws and commandments and will and bring in about the birth of John through supernatural means. I mean, even though this wasn't a virgin birth, it still was supernatural when you consider their age. And them raising up John in their age would have been con considered supernatural because they would have had to have been endued with Yah's energy to keep up with the child and to raise him properly. And so Yah had to silence his mouth. And see, we need to learn from that, that we need to be watchful over the words we say. Death and life are in the power of our tongue, and we will eat the fruit thereof. That there are many things that we speak that negate Yah's word, Yah's promises, because they are filled with fear, worry, anxiety, and because we speak things that are are happening in our bodies that are not biblical and we speak them out and we negate what we've been praying and confessing that by his stripes we're healed that Yah would make a way where there seems to be no way that our flesh is fresher than a child's and it is restored healthier than the days of our youth but then you but then you might say oh man I'm always sick I'm always in pain you know, we do stuff like that. All of us. We all slip up and mess up and, and get into words of unbelief. And so we need to rebuke ourselves. We need to pray constantly and ask Yah and renounce every negative word that we have spoken and to ask His Spirit to help us and to empower us to speak only. Thus saith Yahweh. Some years ago, a prophet in Kentucky spoke prophesied over me that I would teach only what thus saith Yahweh and this prophet spoke that four times you will only speak what thus saith Yahweh only what thus saith Yahweh only what thus saith Yahweh only what thus saith while Yahweh in, in empowering it into me that I need to speak only what thus saith Yahweh then I need not to look at what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, what my emotions are saying, what my mind is saying, what my thoughts are saying, but I need to dwell on, concentrate in, speak on, meditate in what thus saith Yahweh according to the Hebraic Scriptures. And I pass that along to you, that you need to do and follow the same pattern. So, the angel, at least this was one of the reasons, he had to silence John so he wouldn't stop the motion of the supernatural. All right, now let's go down to uh, verse 23. Okay, we're talking about Yeshua's birth, the timeline, when he was born. We're going to get there. And then it says, in uh, verse 23, and it happened when the days of his service were fulfilled, he went to his house. So he left. This is um, the Feast of Shavuot. So, you know, so he left around June-ish, maybe the end of May, uh, first part of June at all is depending, you know, when the full moon takes place. And after these days, his wife conceived. So somewhere it's around June-ish. He conceived, or, she, or Elizabeth conceived, 
and she hid herself five months saying. So five months from then brings us roughly to the month of November. So has Yahweh done to me in the days in which he looked on me to take away my approach from among men. Praise Yahweh. In the sixth month, so that was November, so now we're in December, or the twelfth month. In the sixth month, the cherub Gabriel was sent from the presence of Elohim, Yah, to Galilee, to the city whose name is Nazareth, so this is December, to a virgin who had been betrothed to a man whose name was Yosef, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Marian, or Mary in English. And entering the cherub, and entering, the cherub said to her, Peace to you, full of grace. Oh, I lost my place. Oh, there it is. Our Adonai is with you. You are blessed among women. And seeing this, she was disturbed at his word and considered what kind of greeting this might be. And the cherub said to her, Do not fear, Miriam, for you have found grace, supernatural favor, from Yah. And behold, you will receive conception and bear a son, and you will call his name Yahshua. Yahshua. Now notice what it does not say. Now I know the English translations say Jesus, but it's not Jesus. Why is that? First off, the letter J was not invented to the 1600s. The name Jesus was not invented to the 1600s. This was a Rome pagan name invented to deceive us into participating in pagan holidays, pagan rituals, pagan belief systems. The other thing, and we're going to see throughout all this, that Yosef and Miriam, they kept the Torah. They believed the Torah. They did everything during the birth of Yahshua that would have been in line with Torah. And the name Jesus has nothing to do with Yah and Torah. Now, when you break down Yahshua's name, Y-A-H is the name of the Father. Yah, or Yahweh. Yah, Yahweh. Okay? Shua, S-H-U-A, means salvation. So it's saying in the Hebrew, Yah is salvation. Jesus does not reflect that. Jesus does not say that. Jesus that name does not mean that. It's a Latin name. It's not even a Greek name. It's a Latin name, a Roman name. Okay? So, and I don't say these things to be critical, but, you know, I too once was part of the church and believed in the name of Jesus. Because I saw it in all the scriptures, you know, that in the Bibles that we had. But I never once was encouraged to look it up in the Hebrew. Never once. When you look it up in the Hebrew, that's not it. Yah's name was changed around 7,000 times from Yah, Yahweh, to L-O-R-D, which means Baal. Well, who do you think was behind that? Now, do you know? Do you, check this out. The Hebrew name for Satan is Satan. Well, they translated that properly. Why didn't they do that with Yah? There's a hidden reason. Anyway, let's keep moving on. So then the angel said to Mary, this one, meaning Yahshua, will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and Yah, Elohim, will give him the throne of his father David. Now, something really interesting until I became Hebraic taught and Torah observant, whenever I read the book of Matthew, the first part of that book, it said, 
you know, this begot, this begot, this begot. I skipped that. That didn't mean nothing to me. But when I became Hebraically focused, Matthew was a Hebrew. He wrote this. He wrote this for a reason. Because he was revealing to us that Yahshua was Hebrew. He was not Rome. He was not Latin. He was not of a Rome descent. And that means his parents were not going to give him a Roman name. It's not even an English translation of a Hebrew name. It's an invented Roman name. That's, that's designed after other pagan gods. But nonetheless, let's just keep going. And it says, And he will reign over the house of Jacob to the ages, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Of Yahweh's kingdom, Yahshua's kingdom, it will never end. Praise Yah. But Miriam said to the cherub, How will this be, since I do not know a man? And then the angel begins to explain that the, the power of Yah's spirit will come upon her. Okay, um, and then Miriam's, <clears throat> verse 37, verse 36, And the angel said to her, Behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth, she also conceived the son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her, which it was called barren. Now, again, reiterating, this is the month of December. For nothing shall be impossible with Yah. You need to get that in your personal life. Nothing is impossible for Yah. And you need to believe that He will always make a way for you as His grafted in, born from above son and daughter. He will make a way where there seems to be no way to restore relationships, to heal bodies, to save lost loved ones, to restore our nation to Yah's laws and commandments. And then the angel said, Miriam said, Behold, I am the handmaiden of Yah. Let it be to me according to your word, or according to the Torah. Miriam said, I am your handmaiden. I submit to your Torah and let it be. I will go through whatever I need to go through for the Torah to be fulfilled. And you know, people talked about her back in them days getting pregnant out of, out of wedlock would have been disastrous, a stoning offense. And I don't mean them smoking some weed and getting high. Little joke. Very little, as my wife would say. Okay, and then it says, And the, the cherub, or the angel, departed from her presence. And rising up in those days, Miriam went into the hill country, haste, to a city of Judah. Love the hill country. We all need to live in the country, not in the city. Just joking. And she entered into the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened, as Elizabeth heard Miriam's greeting, the babe in her womb leaped, and Elizabeth was filled with Yah's spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, You are blessed among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now how did she know this? How did she know Miriam never taught. I mean, Miriam didn't email her. She didn't text her. How did she know this? She didn't call her on the telly. How did she know this? By Yah's Spirit. Revelation knowledge. And then she said, verse 43, And why is this to me that the mother of my Adonai comes to me? So she's saying, why is this the mother of my Messiah coming to me? She considered it a great honor. For behold, as the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leaped in exaltation. 
So this tells you that when a baby is in the womb of a mother, that it is full of life. It leaped. It reacted. It had reactions. This negates that abortion is okay. Abortion is murder. Simple as that. All right. Verse 45. And blessed is she believing because there will be a fulfillment to the things spoken to her of Yahweh. And Miriam said, My soul magnifies Yah. My spirit exalted in Elohim, my Savior. The book of Isaiah says Yahweh, Yah, Yahweh, is our Savior. And remember, Yahshua is Yahweh manifested in the flesh. John 1.1 1, 1. And because he has looked at the meekness of his handmaiden, for behold, from now on, he will give me blessings to all generations, because he has done great things for me, who is mighty and holy is his name, Yahweh. And his mercy is to generations of generations for those to come. And he performed mightily with his arm. He scattered proud ones in the thought of his heart. All right, now let's drop down to verse 56. Just to remind you, Zechariah, Luke 1, was during the Feast of Shavuot. He ended his duty and went home, and roughly in the month of June-ish, um, Elizabeth conceived. Five months later, or, or was November, in verse 24, in verse 26, Gabriel came to Miriam. This would be December, so the timeline is December. And December is the Festival of Lights, or Hanukkah. Yahshua, it is believed, was conceived in the Festival of Lights. Why? It validates the scripture that he would be the light of the world. Now, even though Hanukkah is not a major feast, it is still celebrated unto Yahweh. That Yahshua is the light of the world. Okay, verse 56 and Miriam remained about there three months and then returned to her house, okay? This was December, January ish, so now three months later is the end of March, April area. So it is approaching Passover. And the time was fulfilled to Elizabeth for her to bear, and she bore a son. He was born around or at Passover. Okay, and the neighbors and her relatives heard that Elohim magnified his mercy and they rejoiced. And it happened on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child and were calling it by his father's name, Zechariah. And his mother answered saying, Not so, but he shall be called Yohanan, or John. And they said to her, No one is among your kindred who is called by this name. And they signaled to his father what he might desire him to be called. And asking for a writing tablet, he wrote saying, Yohanan is his name. And they all marveled. And instantly his mouth was open, his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, and he blessed Elohim. Interesting fact. In Hebraic culture and custom, you do not give a baby his or her name at birth. You wait until the eighth day, especially for a son. And on the eighth day, he was circumcised into the Abrahamic covenant. In the same way, to my understanding, when a female baby, you also, you didn't circumcise her, obviously, on the eighth day, but you presented her unto Yah and brought her into the covenant, into the Abrahamic covenant. 
on the eighth day and she was given her name which would have been a name consistent with the Hebraic culture with Torah with the Hebraic customs same way <coughs> with uh, the male babies now Yohanan was the Hebrew name for John and it was presented and given his name because Yah said so and then it says verse 65 and fear came on them so all this took place during Passover now one of the reasons and you'll see this when we get into Luke 2 and we're gonna go there now that you'll see now some people believe that Yahshua was born in or during Passover and I don't believe this can be so because first of all John very clearly was born and it would have had to have been 12 months later but we saw that it was in December when it, when it said that Gabriel came to Miriam in the sixth month and we found out the fifth month and we trace that back to when John left the feast of Shavuot and, and, and Elizabeth conceived. So when Elizabeth conceived and you count from there and, and trace it, five months from when Elizabeth conceived Junish would have been December-ish and three months after that would have been Passover-ish, March-April-ish. So even though we don't know the exact date, the scriptures can reveal the approximate season. And another reason that I don't believe it was that Yahshua was born because the math don't add up, kind of like when we were taught to celebrate Good Friday as the day Yahshua was born and Resurrection Sunday, three days and three nights, that math don't add up. So when you trace it back, you begin to learn and discover the truth. And that's for another teaching. But, so, the first day, and I personally believe that the Feast of Sukkot is when Yahshua was born because the first day of Sukkot is a Sabbath. That's when I believe Yahshua was born. The eighth day of Sukkot is a Sabbath as well, and that is when the, the day of circumcision and when they gave him his name and we'll see in Luke 2 that everything they did lined up with the scriptures and so I believe that it was Yahshua was born during the feast of Sukkot because everything about Yahshua coming to the earth and his birth and his death and resurrection happened on the feast day there was no Sabbath, and the Sabbath is, is one of the most important um, feasts of Yah, including the Seventh-day Sabbath. When you learn and you keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, tremendous power and tremendous blessing and peace. And being in right standing, you will begin to feel within you, and it will be such a blessing. I wrote and encouraged uh, my, one of my nephews who's a believer to research about the Sabbath because of the tremendous blessing. If that's the only reason, that's a good reason to get started. It sh shouldn't be the right reason, but it will get you started. And when you research what the scripture says about the Sabbath, that it started in Genesis and Yahshua and the disciples and the first few centuries kept it that tells us how important it is okay Luke chapter 2 now it happened verse 1 in those days that a decree went out from Augustus Caesar that the names of all the people of his dominion should be written down this registration this was about through verse 5 was about that them being taxed that they had to return to the city of their birth to be taxed and this is where much revelation and information comes to us when we understand the times 
of the Hebraic calendar, the times in Israel. First of all, let's just read verse 4. And Joseph went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Why? Because the scripture prophesies that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, uh, Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Because of this being of the house and family of David, uh, uh, Joseph and Miriam were of that how that lineage to be registered with Miriam, the one having been betrothed to him as wife, she being pregnant. Now, here's some things to understand. Bethlehem is roughly five miles from Jerusalem. So they had to go to Jerusalem to celebrate three major feasts. And one of them is Passover. One of them is Sukkot. And so they are in, they are traveling. Now, from where they lived in Nazareth to Jerusalem or slash you know, like a suburb, Bethlehem, is approximately 40 miles. It was mountainous terrain. Now, they didn't have a nice warm car to drive there, put the heat on if it was cold. Now, this could not be in the winter months, because in the winter months in Israel is like the winter months I was born in Wisconsin, like many of the northern states, it's windy, and it's cold, it's snowy, the elements are terrible. I remember some winter months uh, in December in Wisconsin, it'd be 20 below, 10 below, wind would be blowing, you'd have long johns on, you'd have a park on, and they did not have those kind of clothes. I remember when I lived there and I worked in, as a locksmith, I had these Iceman boots. Now they looked like Herman Munster boots, but they were guaranteed to keep your feet warm in 60 below in the in outside temperatures. So when I worked, I remember one day I worked in 60 below temperatures on a golf course putting hasps and padlocks on different cabinets, outdoor cabinets. My feet stayed warm all day. Now every 20 minutes I went into my truck because I kept my truck running because my hands, even though I had thin gloves on, would be bitter cold, cold. my face would be cold, even though I had a hat on, um, ears covered, park over my head. It was nasty. It was cold. But could you imagine walking in that 40 miles? Could you imagine, even if they're on a donkey, being eight months pregnant, bouncing around, up and down, up and down on a donkey or a camel? No way. Could you also imagine giving birth? Because there was no room in the inn, we're going to see. And that sukkahs were, were everywhere. These were three-sided shelters that were not totally closed in. They were closed in by branches and palm trees and so on and so forth. So you could see the sun, or, or you could, you know, you could see the moon. If the sun was out, you, you know, if rain was coming, if snow was coming, if wind was coming, it'd blow right through it. But could you imagine giving birth in that, that your lower extremities were exposed to the na na natural elements? It would be freezing. And could you imagine that your child that was coming out of your womb would be would be entered into and facing even 30 degree 20 degree temperatures wind blowing no way no way and then we find that the scripture says that they laid him in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes and we know swaddling clothes in the hebrew is said that it was priestly garments that were stained with the lamb's blood for, that they experienced when they wore those garments and they sacrificed the lamb for the sin offering. They wrapped Yahshua in these, in these priestly garments, in these swaddling clothes that were stained with lamb's blood, dried lamb's blood 
they wrapped him in swaddling clothes, signifying that he was the Lamb of Yah, signifying of the death that he would take upon himself to be sacrificed as a lamb, as the Lamb of the Most High, for your sin and my sin, for your curse and my curse, for your disease and my disease. He was already, that was prophesying of his sacrifice. Could you imagine them doing that? Now, picture a bucket. If you had a bucket out in the elements, <clears throat> that bucket would be frosted over. Could you imagine even putting a baby in a trough that was frozen over? No way. You wouldn't do that. That baby would get frostbitten. That mother would, would, would be suffering immensely and probably getting sick and disease if that birth took place in December. And see, we've been all taught that it took place in December. But when you read the scripture through Hebraic eyes, when you read the scripture through Hebraic culture and context, it, it couldn't have happened. But now if it was the fall feast, fall temperatures... And we also read here, and, and you can read um, that, uh, that it says <clears throat> that there were shepherds. Uh, let's go on down, um, verse 17. And seeing, pub and seeing, they publicly told about the child, spoken to them about the child. And all these things, hearing, marveled about the sphinx things spoken to them, by the shepherds, Miriam kept all these words meditating in their heart. Verse 15 talks about, It happened as the cherubs departed from them into heaven. Over the men, the shepherds, set, shepherds said to one another, Indeed, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing occurring. Yahweh made known to us. It also says um, somewhere in this that the shepherds, um, kept watch I'm trying to find the exact verse kept watch over the sheep in the field at night they lived in the, sh in the field and they kept watch in the field um, let's see verse oh yeah verse 8 and the shepherds were in the same region living in the fields and keeping guard over the flock by night. Now, if this was in December, no way. One, the, the, the grass or what the sheep would feed on would not be there. Number two, it would be too cold for the shepherds to live in and to dwell in in December months. Think about the desert. There are no trees, or very few trees. Got a bug out here bothering me, sorry. Think about the desert. We lived in, in New Mexico in the desert. In the desert, there's a few trees, a few branches, but there's tons of tumbleweeds. You light on fire a tumbleweed, tumbleweed in a matter of seconds, it's gone. So you would not be able to contain and sustain a fire to keep warm. So they couldn't have lived in this time period, in December, in the keeping watch over the flock. But if it was in the fall feast, you could easily stay warm because it's 70, 80, maybe even 90 during the day. But at night, it drops in temperature, but not freezing temperature. In New Mexico, it could be 100 during the day, but at night it'd be in the mid-60s, sometimes upper 50s, comfortable. You could also give birth to a child in that without it being dangerous for the child and for the mother. And see, if you read all these things through Hebraic eyes, you will see that it is revealing the scripture in Luke 1 and Luke 2 is revealing Yahshua's birth. Now think about this. 
Okay, John was born at Passover, okay? And if you count Passover, so you count March, April, so May, June would be one, June, July would be two, July, August would be three. Oh wait, no, I messed that up, sorry. Uh, March, April would be one, um, April, May would be two, May, June would be three, June, July would be four, July, August would be five, um, July, August, August, September would be six, uh, somehow I'm messing it up, but anyways, oh yeah, th that would be six months, September, October would be six months, because Miriam was already three months pregnant at Passover, so when you count it, okay, let's count it again, sorry, um, March, April is 1, April, May 2, May, June 3, June, July 4, July, August 5th, September, October 6th. So then that would bring you to the 6th month. Miriam was already 3 months pregnant. This would reveal when Yahshua was born. Very simple math. All right, the other thing I want us to notice as we begin to close here, um, look uh, in verse 20. And it says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising Yahweh for all things which they heard and saw, even as was spoken to them. When the eighth day had passed to circumcise the child. Again, he was circumcised on the eighth day, which is a high Sabbath. That would just make sense. And that would knock out, there is no eighth day Sabbath in the in Passover. Okay, and it says, verse 22, And when the days of her cleansing according to the law of Moses was fulfilled, again, everything had to be according to the Torah, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to Yahweh. And it was, and it has been written in the Torah of Yah, every male opening a womb shall be called a holy one to Yah, and to offer a sacrifice according to that said in the Torah of Yah, a pair of turtle doves and two nestling doves. And then we can read about Simeon and, you, and how he says he now can depart because he has seen the Messiah. He has seen Israel's salvation. And then we also can read about um, Hannah and that how she said, verse 36, there was Hannah, a prophetess, and she was advanced in many days. She lived 70, seven years with her husband from her virginity, and she was a widow of 84 years who did not depart from sanctuary, serving night and day with fastings and praying. When you just read that, you think she lived all her life in the temple. But no, she lived all her life during the feast days. This was during the Feast of Sukkot. So during the Feast of Sukkot, she was in the temple praying and interceding for the Messiah to be born during the Feast of Sukkot. And she said she now can depart. She now can depart. So anyways, uh, let's look in verse 27 as we begin to close here. And by the Spirit he came into the sanctuary. And as the parents were bringing in the child, Yahshua, for them to do according to the custom of the Torah concerning him. And so you see here that everything they did, Miriam and Joseph did, was according to to 
the custom of Torah. And it is my personal belief that the scripture reveals that Yahshua was born during the Feast of Sukkot, that he was born on the Sabbath, the first day Sabbath, and his circumcision took place on the um, next day Sabbath. Now here's another interesting fact that during the Feast of Sukkot, because there was no room in the inn, they had to go over to Bethlehem and they stayed in Bethlehem, not in an inn, but in Sukkot. And the word stable in the Hebrew means Sukkah, a three-sided shelter, booth, tent, that they built during the Feast of Sukkah. If this was to take place, like some believe, during Passover, there were no Sukkahs. They would have been out in the elements. The other thing concerning the um, harvest, when they had to go to Jerusalem because they were being taxed, this was the most prosperous time of the year for Hebraic people because the, the full harvest just ended. The harvest that takes place at Passover is just a wheat harvest, I believe, if I'm remembering accurately. But the harvest that takes place during Sukkot is the harvest of everything. And so the Hebrew people would have the most money that if they were going to tax them, this would be the time to tax them. And so it, Jerusalem and surrounding community, Bethlehem, was filled. And Miriam and Yosef lived or dwelt in a sukkah because there was no room in an inn. And they gave birth in a sukkah. A trough was there by a sukkah so they could keep their animals close to their sukkah. And they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles in a sukkah in a trough, where in Passover, they probably wouldn't have that many troughs, but everybody would have a trough for, maybe they kept their sheep close to them, so on and so forth. And so we went through, um, I'm just kind of going over my notes, I believe I've covered just about everything there was to cover. And so again, Remind yourself, this couldn't have been December. Because in December, that, we that weather is nasty. Just like a Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota weather. You are going to be outside as little as possible. And especially at night, you're not going to be, at least during the day, you can dress for it. And the sun would give you some type of warmth. I remember uh, being in Wisconsin and that sun would beat in your vehicle, and it would, it would melt the ice on your windshield. So anyways, I pray that I presented enough information and enough truth for you to do your research, for you to think about when Yahshua was born. It was not December. It was not December. And I encourage you, um, we will talk about December when December comes, about what you are celebrating when you are celebrating the winter solstice. But we want to be celebrating during the feast of Sukkot, Yahshua's birthday. That's, that's part of what Sukkot is about, is to celebrate, is to honor, is to give reverence to Yahshua's birthday. And so, Father, we just thank you for this word. We thank you for this teaching. We just thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding concerning Yahshua's birth, Yahshua's timeline, and give us revelation, give us understanding. I may not have presented everything, so please amplify things, bring further revelation through other great men and women of Yah that we're teaching. I encourage you to research it on YouTube, on Google so on and so forth. Do your own study and come up with your conclusion. One thing is for certain, Yahshua was not born in December. So Father, until next time, I pray that you would make a way where there seems to be no way that, that you 
would make your face shine on all of us and um, that we would come to know you in a greater way. I pray for those that are suffering in any way in their lives that you would end their mourning, that you would end their mourning and bring about their joy in the power of your name. You can connect with us on Facebook, Mark Pulley, Yash, Yahweh, Yahshua Assembly. You can also connect with us at our website, Yahweh Yeshua Assembly. And if you feel led, we also have a donation button there to help us keep putting the gospel out of the Torah and of the, the, the blood sacrifice of Yahshua, that he is the Messiah. And that to be Torah observant is to combine Torah and the atonement. Until next time, Yahweh bless you, Yahweh make his face shine upon you, and Yahweh give you shalom. So I say to you, shalom, shalom.